Amen. It is great to be back on the hill. I never visit here without thinking of the first time. It was the fall semester 1983. I walked into the rotunda for the very first time to register for classes. And as I stood there in a long line that day, and we got to the front, and the guy in front of me we'd been visiting, and the register, I suppose it was, signed his name, and then he wrote an abbreviation of a scripture. And this is not a preacher story. This actually happened. He wrote Matthew 5, 16, but he scribbled so it looked like Matthew 5, 26. And so as we went to the next line, I had my Bible, and I looked at it, and instead of saying, and let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven, it said... Verily I say unto you, you shall not leave till you paid the last cent. (laughs) And so I had to reevaluate what seminary education was really going to cost. A couple days after that, I walked into my first classroom, a young professor teaching his very first course, Intro to Missiology. His name was Dr. Daniel Sanchez. And we sat there and he gave us a, a syllabus. And one of our assignments was we had to interview a missionary. I don't know if you still have to do that. But on the seminary campus at that time was a guest professor. His name was Baker James Cawthon. Now, Dr. Cawthon was the retired longtime president of the Foreign Mission Board, now the International Mission Board. And I thought, well, if I have to interview a missionary, why not go to the top? And so I set an appointment and went to his office in the wing over here. And I learned very quickly as I interviewed him, he interviewed me. And I would ask him two questions, then he would ask me one. And I'll never forget. He said, "Uh, young man, you're going overseas, are you not? And I said, no, sir, I I don't think so. And then, of course, he continued to say, well, why not? And help me with the answer. What's the get-out-of-jail-free card? God has not called me to go overseas. Isn't that the end of the discussion? God has not called me to do that. So I was already wiping the sweat off my brow until he said the next question, how do you know? And I said, well, that's all the information I need. Thank you. And uh, I wrote up the report, but I never got away from the question. And so I pose it to you this morning. And at the end, there'll be an opportunity for you to answer it, not for this guest missionary, but for the Father who asked it of all of us. The Foreign Mission Board started in 1845. And we have had many new structures and reorganizations, and last year we had the joy to do that again. And in the latest reorganization, we have strictly gone to people groups. And so I have the joy to work among Europeans anywhere in the world. We call Canadians European. I know that's geographically challenged. Australians, Germans in Brazil, and all over the world. And with the new structure came a new vision statement. It's the third vision statement we've had in the 20 years since I've been appointed, but it is by far my favorite. For it says, our vision is a multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue, knowing and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ. By definition, a vision statement is a projection of a preferred future. That's what a vision statement is. But I like this one because it is, in reality, a preview of a promised future. We've been in Revelation, I've understood this week. Well, we're going back there now. If you have your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 7. And we come to that ninth verse, and John, of course, is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he writes of the 144,000, then he gets to verse 9, he says, And after these things I looked, and behold, a multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, gathered around the throne. And they cry out with a loud voice, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne. And we pick up in verse 11. All the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. And all the angels, it says, fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Friend, that is not a hoped-for scene someday. It is an assured reality as much as any past reality has ever been. The only question is going to be, what is your part and what is my part in the realization of the uncountable multitude in the heavenly throne room? When John wrote those words at the end of the first century, scholars believed there were about 200 million people that lived on planet earth. It would be about 1350 when it would pass 300 million. 1700 it would pass about 600 million. 1800 about 900 million. 1900, about 1.6 billion population. 1952 and a half billion. 1985, it passed 5 billion. This year, we're approaching 7 billion. If the Lord tarries by the end of this decade, 
we shall crest eight billion. The uncountable numbers are already present on planet Earth. If you want to track over those years the growth of the Foreign Mission Board, now the International Mission Board, it took us 110 years before we had 1,000 appointments in 1955. By 1965, we had 2,000. By 1979, we had 3,000. By 1994, 4,000. By 2001, 5,000. Without the economic downturn, by next year, we would have crested 6,000. But I'm saddened to report today that the numbers are going down. It let me correct something that I have read that is untrue. What I have read is that the numbers are going down because Southern Baptists do not have the funds. And that is not true. Southern Baptists brought in $12.5 billion last year. 2.5% went to reach international missions. There was more money spent last year in the Southern Baptist Convention on the interest, the interest on building loans than on international missions. It's not a financial problem, it's a heart problem. And my prayer is that God will awaken the heart of His people because He will, he will affirm His purposes and He may bring Koreans and Brazilians and Chinese and others to do it, but He will honor His name. And my prayer is that we will lose the opportunity to be used. Another countdown that we find is actually when Jesus walked this earth in Matthew 24, 14, he made a, a fascinating statement. He said, In this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world as a witness or a testimony to all the nations, and then the end will come. I believe very firmly in the sovereignty of God, and so I don't believe God is waiting on my obedience or disobedience. But in his own self-will, he has determined that all the nations will be engaged with the gospel before the end will come. In 2006, leaders of many of the major sending organizations came together under the banner of finishing the task. And as they gathered there, they had accumulated research, nearly 700 unengaged, unreached people groups of over 100,000 were found around the planet. At that meeting, about 400 were adopted by various agencies. And over the next three years, about 300 were engaged by these agencies and believers are now in about 300 of those and churches have been established in over a hundred of them and so we see the countdown that the nations are hearing every year we, we read of 20 or 30 or 40 new people groups for the first time having John 3:16 in their language and hearing for the first time that there's a God who loved them so much he sent his only begotten son in Europe, we can too testify. We have over 40 people groups of over 100,000 that we have not engaged, but as God is our witness by the end of this decade as he gives us help, not just the IMB, but with our partners, we will seek to engage them with the viable gospel witness. I can share of one such people group. I, I cannot name them because of security, but our, our missionaries arrived there seven years ago now, and they begin to learn a challenging language in a Muslim context, and they plowed and they sowed the seed faithfully and they, they learned the language and they shared their faith winsomely but a year and two and three and four and five went by without any visible fruit and then the first person came to faith now think with me in a people group of a couple hundred thousand three hundred thousand and you had one believer one convert who would it be the mayor a celebrity a wealthy businessman this was a high school senior boy only believer in his people group. Well, he was beaten the first time he shared his faith. He was called into the principal's office of his public high school, and the principal harangued him and said, you must leave this foreign God and return to Muhammad. And he said, how can I leave the God who sent his son to die for me? And as he left the principal's office, the gang was waiting again, and they beat him even more severely. But the story really isn't about five years to get to one. The story is within five weeks, he had seen three come to faith. And now there is a group of believers in this once unengaged, unreached people group. Come back to the passage with me. As you see that uncountable multitude, it says in the description, clothed in white robes. Now what would that mean? What would that symbolize? And in fact, I want to read on in the context there in 13. It says, then one of the elders answered saying to me, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? And I said to him, sir, you know, so he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now this is not an eschatological sermon. I'm not getting into timetables. And I just want to give the simplest understanding that this is a crowd of the redeemed. 
These are those whose robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Those who have named the name of Jesus as Lord and Master in this life. But I want to show you the chapter before that. If you'll turn back one page probably. Chapter 6 and verse 9. For we find another mention of white robes. We read, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. He sees the martyrs. Verse 10, And they cried out with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Do you hear what it says? It's another indicator about the closeness or the coming of that great throne room scene. We've already read the gospel is going to be preached into all the nations and it says here when the number of the martyrs is completed the end will come. Many times I hear people refer to the age of the martyrs as the first century in, in the catacombs. Surely you have learned in your time on the hill that there have been more martyrs in the last hundred years than the previous 19 centuries combined. 26 of my fellow workers in the history of the Foreign Mission Board had paid the ultimate price of a martyr's death. But the most telling of that is over half have been killed in the 20 years since our appointment. I believe the cost to go to the edge is going to be higher than we've ever paid. And the question is, is the church willing to pay that price? Clothed in white robes. There are martyrs this day, and in our prayer earlier, it was referenced, the persecution around the world. Surely you've heard the story of Orissa, India, less than two years ago. A leader of a, a militant Hindu sect was assassinated. In fact, the Maoists claimed the assassination, but they said, no, it was the Christians who did this. Because over the five previous years, hundreds of thousands of people had turned from Hinduism, and they had embraced the cross and over 150 were killed in those immediate days of a riot that came and rushed through those villages. And then systematically over the next weeks and months, they went house to house and they would pull everyone out and they would have one question. Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? And if the answer was no, you could return to your home. If the answer was yes, they took a torch and they lit. 4,500 structures were burned. And over 70,000 refugees this day are gathered without homes simply because... They bowed their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Clothed in white robes, it goes on to say, and palm branches were in their hands. Now, I don't remember the theological discussion if there will be palm trees in heaven, but there will be palm branches. That's what we read in Revelation chapter 7. And you remember the symbolism there, Palm Sunday, that the, the victory march, the triumphal entry. And it wasn't just our Lord Jesus a couple hundred years before He came in. Judas Maccabees came in to a palm parade. It was a sign of victory. And so we need to remember that we don't present a gospel that's anemic. In fact, Paul in Romans tells us the power of God into salvation to all who believe. And my fear is as I travel this side of the ocean, I don't often see a victorious gospel. I see a gospel that is often held close instead of given freely. It is still powerful. My friend who leads the work in Asia tells the story in Indonesia about a project among farmers and they, they came together just months ago, and there were two or three believing farmers, and they brought uh, about 16 or 18 other farmers together for an agricultural project. But every evening, they would store the Bible from creation to Christ. And the first evening they met, in walked unexpectedly a member of Al-Qaeda. And so these believing farmers pulled off to the side, and, and they asked our worker, what should we do? We're putting these men in danger and at risk. And after they prayed, they said, well, we will be faithful to God. And they begin to tell the stories, first night, second night, third night. The last night, they told the story of the cross and the crucifixion and the resurrection. And several repented and believed. And as they're about to, to end the meeting, this representative had not spoken any that week. And he said, wait, I, I've got to know. Is this true? And they said, friend, it's all true. And he said, then I want to know such a God who would send his son and he responded to the gospel and he said, and you must go with me to my village because they've never heard. And he's pastoring the church in his village. The gospel is powerful. It, it can snuff out a life man can, but it cannot stop the gospel. 
North Africa, just a few months ago, an underground Christian was seized by the police and interrogated. And he, and he was beaten and he refused to give the location of their meeting. He refused to divulge the names of the other believers. They brought his brother from his home and they put a gun in his ear. And they said, you tell us or he dies. And he said, sir, I can't tell you. And he watched as they killed his brother right there. But for the sake of the gospel. Palm branches are already there, friend. They're just waiting on us to arrive. Because it is a victorious gospel. The end of the scene, it says, and all the angels, think about that, all the angels gathered. There's nowhere else to be. There's no message to send. There's no wind to hold back. There's no seal to open. They are all gathered, and they do what I believe will be natural for all of us to do. It says they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. It's with sadness that I share an observation as I travel in this part of the world sometimes. I believe one reason we're seeing explosive growth in other parts of the world is that many on this continent have lost the understanding of the holiness of God. God is the, the man upstairs. God is the one who wants to give me an abundant life now. And I could write a book. And God is the one who wants to pay my mortgage. And he wants to, to give me a boat. And he wants to do everything according to my plans. And I believe we lose sight over who is the one that's high and lifted up. And who is the one who's in presence, I believe, is Isaiah. We would say, woe, woe is me, for I am a sinful man. I've served in Poland most of the last 20 years. And I'll just focus on one part of the, uh, the work there and where I saw the holiness of God come to bear. In fact, we have a couple here, the Whitleys, who work among the Roma people, the Gypsies, uh, they serve in Brazil. But also in southern Poland, we have work among the gypsies. And oftentimes, as we engage them with the gospel, they will respond, even, even for me? E even I can believe? And it's amazing just to come to them and say, yes. The Creator God who is holy, He sent His Son to die for you. And they've been turning more rapidly to the gospel than probably any other people group in our European affinity. One story that's just so fascinating to me that I, I just heard in recent weeks was in Tarnów, a, a town in southern Poland. There's a believer there that our missionary led to the Lord several years ago and is mentored. And he's become like the pastor, one of the two Roma pastors. And he was on Skype. Now that was uh, right there was kind of hard for me to see. Here's a Roma with a, a hand-me-down, hand-me-down computer Skyping online with a Roma who made his way to England. And if you know the Roma or the Gypsies, they're very migratory. And it was a believer in England. And they're Skyping, and the, the one in Tarnu says, friend, we've got to close out because our Bible study is about to start. And the friend in England said, well, can I listen in? He said, sure. So he just left the computer on. They had the Bible study, and after it was over, he went back to the computer. And his friend said, if I invite friends, can we do this again next week? And it's a long story, but what ends up, there are two new Bible studies in England, six new believers via Skype to southern Poland where gypsies are talking about Jesus. <laughs> That is what the Lord desires to do. He is not seeking, it's hard for me to say, educated people. I believe we do better with education than without. But what he's seeking is hearts that are on fire for him. I want to close this morning by re-asking the questions I was asked in a hall not too far from here. I was raised in a Baptist church. I prayed for missions. But in my mind, missionaries were a different category. There were people God called, and then there were people God sent an email to, and those were the missionaries. And then I began to read the New Testament. You know what it says? It says go. And I never see where it says quit. Now, your going may end up being closer than my going, but my conviction is this. My conviction is until you put on the altar anywhere, God can't use you anywhere. When I graduated from here, and I hope that the uh, practice has changed because I don't want to embarrass anyone, but in the placement office, I remember filling out a form at my graduation uh, for any pulpit committees or pastor search committees that would uh, ask for resumes. And on the old form, it used to say, I'm willing to serve, and it gave geographical locations, Texas, Southeast, Southwest, Midwest. And I, it, you know, most people were through in five minutes. It took me 30 minutes to read that thing thinking, how can I tell God where I'm willing to serve. So I think I ended up just circling the page and, and turning it in, and I ended up being called to a church in Texas. And so 
you know, God is sovereign. I, I'm not saying that I, I went to, to Canada or Montana or somewhere, but from Texas, he led us to Poland. So my question to you is the repeat of Dr. Baker James Calton. Young man, young woman, you're going overseas, aren't you? And if the answer is no, and your conviction this day is, I, I don't think God is leading me. The companion question is still the same, how do you know? And please don't hear me contradict what the Lord may or may not be telling you. But my question is simply this, have you ever put it on the altar? Would you bow with me? And I'm going to ask our instrumentalist to please come to the keyboard. With every head bowed and every eye closed, this is a time simply to do business. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the one who says to go into all the world in the first century has not retracted his marching orders. And the question is, have you ever truly said wherever you lead? I'll go. I'm not asking if you've ever sung it. I'm asking if you've ever meant it. In just a moment, this altar will be open. If you need to come and simply lay your, your knees and your head as well as your heart before the Lord, I'll invite you to do that or where you stand in a moment. But don't leave this place holding on to anything but the assurance of God's call in your life. And our Father in heaven, I thank you for this is holy ground, not primarily because some of the greatest servants in your kingdom's work have taught here and walked here, but because, Lord, in your wisdom, you have chosen to bless. And Father, it was in this place that you made clear to me as a young man wanting to preach your word that there was a world out there that had never heard it once. Father, I see in this congregation so many gifted young men and women. The next army that you could raise to finish the battle. To bring to pass the gospel into that last unengaged, unreached people group. Oh, Father, find us willing and find us obedient to go wherever you'll lead. Take this time and honor yourself, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand, and we will not tarry. But if the Lord has spoken to your heart, and you need to come to this altar simply as a public way to bow your knee as you bow your heart to say, Lord Jesus, I am placing it all on the altar. I don't know what that means. I don't know where that may lead. But I feel impressed this morning to give you the opportunity to do that. And I simply ask you to be obedient to him.